China's total GDP in 1980 was under $90 billion in current dollars. Today, it is over $12 trillion. The world has never seen such enormous economic growth in such a short time. We made it easy for them. The US gave China a good part of our GDP by moving factories there in exchange for cheap labor. We helped China to build industry without borrowing. China got jobs for its dispossessed rural population and technology exchanges with all those factories. The Chinese think and plan on a time scale unknown in the West. Asked what he thought the effects were of the French Revolution in 1789, a Chinese leader responded, it's too early to tell. World powers come and go. The US has had its turn and made a mess of it. We've squandered our advantages. We've spent trillions on pointless wars. Meanwhile, we've given China much of our industrial base in exchange for cheap labor. That destroyed our jobs base. At the same time, we've given them technology just so they would buy a few things from us. China will be getting revenge on the West that treated it so badly. We didn't sell China the rope to hang us. We sent the rope factory to China so they could make it themselves. The US has accelerated China's rise by 50 to 100 years. Welcome to the Atlantis Report. With the advent of time, global geopolitical discourse is increasingly getting shifted towards and driven by economics rather than military or hard power dimension. So far, the US maintained its grip over world order using a combination of hard power and its excellent economic credentials being the largest economy in the world. However, the global geopolitical narrative is undergoing transformation at an unprecedented pace. In the shaping of world order, economics is assuming primacy over military strength or hard power dimension. According to a report of the IMF, China has surpassed the US as the largest GDP in the world. According to IMF estimates, the Chinese GDP in PPP terms stands at the $23 trillion, whereas the USA's GDP in PPP terms is $19 trillion. When calculated on nominal GDP terms, the USA's GDP stands at $18.5 trillion, whereas the Chinese GDP is estimated worth $11.4 trillion. According to IMF estimates, the GDP growth rate of China is approximately 6.90%, whereas for the US it is just 2.60%. China is also the second largest US Treasury bondholder after Japan. In terms of investments outside the country, China is rapidly enhancing its footprint in hitherto unexplored regions like Africa and Latin America. It is attempting to bolster its ties across the world through generous investments and the transfer of technologies. One Belt One Road project encompassing more than 60 countries in the world with anticipated cumulative investments worth the $4 billion to the $8 billion according to different timeframes and variables, is clearly a symbol of China's ambition to unleash its economic dominance over the world. Although Chinese military capabilities are nowhere matched to that of the USA. But when combined with that of Russia, it definitely reaches near to the US's military and defense capabilities. Russia has a higher number of nuclear weapons than the US. Presently the US has 38 operational overseas military bases located across length and breadth of the world. In comparison, Russia has roughly 10 overseas military bases, mostly situated in erstwhile USSR countries. But China is aggressively acquiring military bases across the Indian Ocean. Its doctrine of a string of pearls is case in point. In addition to this, its assertive behavior in the South China Sea and the East China Sea underscores its ambition to assume a more substantial role in the Pacific Ocean. U.S.-China bilateral trade stands at the whooping U.S. $659 billion, with the trade balance in favor of China. U.S. trade deficit with China is of extremely high order amounting to the U.S. $336 billion. In case China decides to declare trade embargo on the USA, it might cripple the US economy. Due to all these factors, China is poised to replace the USA as a global hegemon in the near foreseeable future. Right now, a picture is emerging where China and the USA are getting involved in Thucydides trap. Donald Trump's administration is cognizant of power and clout that China presently wields over world order and global geopolitics. Any conflict of serious scale with China would be detrimental to the political economy of the USA. Hence US administration under the presidency of Donald Trump is harboring cautious approach with regards to China.
China is a nation that has decided that it will not bow before the U.S. To that, you may say, well Russia and North Korea aren't bowing to the U.S. either, and you would be half right. Sure they are not, but neither poses a real threat to the United States hegemony of the respective regions they operate in Europe in the case of Russia and South Korea in the case of North Korea. In a conventional war, which means no nukes are used as that's just bad for everyone. North Korea ceases to be a country, and Russia gets relegated to the official third world, developing nation status. China is neither of those and, as such, definitely poses a threat to the US in the West Pacific. This line of thinking began in earnest after the US steamrolled the Iraqi military in 1991's operation, Desert Storm. Iraq, at that time, was one of the world's best militaries not named the USA or a NATO country, and China was probably on par with Iraq militarily at that time. Now granted, the US ran roughshod over the Iraqi army because they were facing the wrong way due to the US lying to Iraqi military command consistently leading up to the attack. Up until that time, Iraq was considered an ally of sorts, and Saddam only invaded Kuwait because he was given permission or allowed to believe he had permission from the US. China saw what the US was capable of doing to people it was friendly with and thought about what it would do to people it only tolerated because of money. Historical side notes, I am sure nobody here is under the illusion that the US and China are friends in any way. They are okay with each other for two reasons. 1. Neither can necessarily do anything about the other. 2. A lot of money is involved. Take Taiwan, for example. Officially the United States recognizes it as a part of China, meaning on paper they say it. But they say it with a very obvious wink that they show to everyone, including China. In reality, China bought that recognition by promising to open China to foreign investors if the US and by proxy UN would switch the official recognition of China from the Republic of China, aka Taiwan to the People's Republic of China, aka Mainland China. The US did so but maintains a defense treaty with Taiwan, sells it billions of dollars in weapons, and maintains political contact through the American Institute in Taiwan. 8. The American Institute in Taiwan is essentially the US State Department without the official title. Meaning all of the same diplomatic ties are maintained without officially maintaining them. Meaning the acknowledgement of the People's Republic of China as the real owner of Taiwan is a sham, and everyone, including Taiwan and especially China, knows this. China has never ruled out invading Taiwan and militarily bringing it under the control of Beijing, thus officially ending the Chinese Civil War in which the Communist Party overthrew the KMT government. Up until 20 to 25 years ago, China would have lost any attempt to capture Taiwan in a one-on-one -on -one fight. However, their military might is as such that while they cannot fight the US and win, they could capture Taiwan in about 90 days Taiwanese estimates in an extremely bloody and costly victory. This is without US intervention. With US intervention and likely Japanese and Korean support, the Chinese Navy would be destroyed, and the Chinese military would be set back 20-something years, and the idea of ever capturing Taiwan would likely be gone forever. The key factor here is US involvement. The sole reason why China has not overtly tried to take Taiwan is because of fear of US involvement, thus the rapid and intense development of Chinese military capabilities to neutralize that threat. This is evident in its development of aircraft carriers, one in service, one on the way, and two more in the planning phase. The stepped-up antagonization of Taiwan even though they are not stupid enough to invade yet. Their refusal to completely isolate the Kim regime as it doesn't align with their political needs at the moment, and the zone of denial ring in the South China Sea. Let's be clear on the South China Sea SCS. There is nothing Chinese about it other than the name which was given by European explorers. This is a purely economic and military move by China to control one of the most important sea lanes in the world and create a zone of denial that would force any naval invasion force to attack from the East China Sea where it can direct the terms of engagement. Now I do not blame China for doing this, as this is in China's best interest notice I said China, not the US or the world's best interest. However, if China were not afraid of the US, they wouldn't be taking such steps to consolidate their control over their neighbors and create various lines of defense to combat the power of the US Navy specifically. China is now looking to consolidate and expand its military influence in the South China Sea. 
John Mearsheimer, a scholar of international relations, believes that nations have great insecurity and uncertainty regarding other states' intentions, which automatically leads to aggressive competition among states. If this proposition holds, China will undoubtedly begin to pose fundamental challenges to the post-World War II global alliances, trade arrangements, and exclusive U.S. maritime control of the world's oceanic trade as it becomes more capable and confident. In the meantime, one cannot expect the U.S. to sit by and watch its controls be eroded slowly. As China's regional power grows, the costs to America of resisting China's ambitions will continue to grow with it. The U.S. may even reach the point at which the costs of resisting China's regional ambitions indirectly outweigh the political and economic benefits. In order to prepare to resist China more directly, the U.S. must first extract itself from NATO and high-cost, low-intensity conflicts Syria and Afghanistan, and concentrate on strengthening its alliances in Asia. Since the demise of the Soviet Union in 1990, the U.S. has spent trillions of dollars on NATO. The U.S. currently pays 22% of NATO's budget of $250 billion per year, the world's second-highest military budget. The most significant post-World War II military and economic alliance are in the process of being dismantled due to the shift in U.S. focus towards Asia. In order to project power effectively, the U.S. had, in previous decades, developed substantial military infrastructure and presence in several Asian countries and the Pacific Islands. In order to reduce the regional U.S. influence in the South China Sea, Chinese naval forces are being rapidly expanded, and they will exceed the size of the U.S. Navy in quantitative terms by 2050. China is likely to remain behind the U.S. Navy in qualitative terms in the foreseeable future. The U.S. currently maintains the world's most formidable naval armada spearheaded by 11 aircraft carriers, through which it currently projects air and sea power across the vast expanse of the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Many political thinkers are divided over the chances of the U.S. continuing as the only global superpower. Peter Zihan, an eminent geostrategist, believes that the U.S. is endowed with abundant natural resources and advantageous geography. He believes that since China does not possess these inherent advantages, the U.S. will remain the only superpower in the world. On the other end of the spectrum, Jeffrey Sachs believes that the period of American exceptionalism has come to an end, and other nations, especially the Chinese, have caught up to the U.S. in several aspects. He believes that the U.S. will be unable to dominate the world under the present circumstances in a manner that it did over the past 70 years. On the economic front, the Trump trade tariffs are a way of warning China to stay away from the U.S. sphere of global influence. The U.S. government also wants to slow down China's economic growth and reduce its speed of political, military, and economic expansion. Nobel Prize-winning economist Paul Krugman believes that the runaway success of the Chinese economy is due to it possessing the best economies of scale in several key manufacturing industries in the world. And this advantage will keep China pointed towards a high growth trajectory despite U.S. sanctions. China and the U.S. will have to use diplomatic solutions in order to create an atmosphere of shared coexistence. If China accepts the U.S. as a senior partner, it will radically reduce the risk of future military conflict. Deng Xiaoping's dictum of, hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead, has been completely replaced by the globally encompassing vision, which is called the, Xi Jinping thought. President Xi wants China to lead in what he calls international order, international system, and global governance by 2050. In conclusion, a majority of the world wants to be on the right side of the US, be it also does not want to be enemies with China. It is now up to China to create regional and global confidence in its being a soft power for it to enhance its regional dominance. If push comes to shove, will the Leninist Chinese authoritarian government triumph over the capitalistic and democratic US? Let us know in the comments section below what you think. This was the Atlantis Report. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.